Welcome to In the Author's Studio. And today we have with us Greg Sattel, who will be discussing the book, Cascades. I'm Andrea Cates, and I'm with Future Proofing Next. And Future Proofing Next, we say we're innovation you can take to the bank. And we work with corporations and teams and scale-ups to figure out ways to see ahead into the future and actually do something about it to drive business growth. The first thing we want to do with Greg Sattel, first of all, welcome, Greg. We're super excited to have you here in the author's studio. Thanks so much for having me, Andrea. And people are probably wondering what it's like to go to a book club where you haven't read the book or to go to a conversation in a meeting. We know Amazon is famous for making sure that everyone reads the six page document before the meeting starts. So I've read your book many times and reviewed it, loved the book, feel like it's really relevant to the important priorities for leaders today in terms of going from an older mindset of leadership to a newer mindset of leadership. And what we believe at Future Proofing is that there's a need to lead in a new way, especially in, in the current economic situation and, and in the current global situation. So we would love for you to give us, in a nutshell, what is it I about- I was wondering what the significance <laughs> of that. I was sitting here so puzzled. In a nutshell. I, I, was, I, was, I was thinking, what's the point? Because I wasn't sure if they were nuts or they were pits. Yeah, I didn't. I was, and I wasn't sure who it referred to, whether it was you or whether it was me. But yeah, yeah. what we like so, to do in the beginning is have you give us kind of in a nutshell, like the way we talk about elevator pitches and startup land, in the world of cascades, and especially as it pertains to business leaders. What are the foundational principles before we get into some of the details? What what, what is cascades in a nutshell? Cascades is about transformation. And in my first book, Mapping Innovation, I talked about innovation as a three-part process of discovery, engineering, and transformation. And I think we vastly underestimate what it takes to make a transformation. We focus on the idea, whether it's a good idea or whether, it's a, whether the thing works or doesn't work. And if it works and it's a good idea, we, we kind of feel like our, our job is done. But in actuality, it takes, on average, about 30 years to go from a, an, an initial discovery to an, a, a real impact on the marketplace. That's, so that gives us an indication of how difficult a transformation is. And uh, since then, in, in further research, I found that it's often very, very difficult to drive a transformation, even for things that we know that work. Skills-based transformations about things like, like uh, agility, uh, agile development, like user-centered design, stuff that we've known really works for 10 or 20 years. And even that is hard to get adopted widely throughout a, an organization. So it's, it's a very, very difficult process getting change to take hold. And that's what I tried to provide a, a roadmap for in Cascades. Well, one of the things that we'll talk about now is, is we'll get a little bit more into, into the discussion because the reason that we're so interested in this is that the future-proofing community tends to be people who are pragmatic. We love examples. We love news you can use, things that are really happened. And we'll talk about some corporate examples, especially later on in our conversation. And the theory is really important as well. But the first thing that I think is really important to talk about is how you really got interested in change and how change has changed. So could you talk a little bit about the fact that change has changed? This is actually a statistic I came across recently, but, but it blew my mind. So in 1975, 83% of a typical corporation's assets were tangible assets. So things like physical plan, a factory, equipment, maybe money in a bank account, but things that we could, we could touch. By 2015, that had flipped and 84% of a typical corporation's assets are intangible. Now, remember when, you have, you have to remember that the whole practice of change management took place in the early 80s. So what, 
what, what was changed back then was usually some kind of physical change, a strategic change. In fact, the, the first case study was Burroughs versus NCR and how they adapted to electronic computing. So you're talking about investments that were made at a very, very senior level, if not the CEO level. And change management was really about making people okay with those changes. Where today we're 84% or, or probably even higher now are intangible assets. When we talk about change, we're talking about changes in the people themselves, what they believe, how they think, how they act. And that's a completely different thing. So when we talk about change management, the traditional change management. We're talking about the 1983 version of change management for the most part. It's as if we have this entire practice or almost industry that's focused on teaching people to make really, to, 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 to make really good mixtapes with, 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 uh, cassette, with cassettes or to DJ with cassettes. Well, that would be great if anybody had an interest or if that was at all useful, but nobody uses cassette tapes anymore. And probably a large portion of your audience has no idea what a cassette tape is. And so it's really important that we, when we think about change, we think about as it exists today. And that is getting people to change how they think and how they behave. And that's a much different thing because people don't like to change. <laughs> well, one of the things I wanna talk about is, uh, well, first of all, I'm, I'm curious if this is universal because I, I know we were just having a conversation a little bit ago about China and the, uh, the differences in some geographies in terms of whether it's a physical asset-based or a talent-based society right now, what the economic drivers are, whether they're a market, market or ma manufacturing product production, where innovation comes from in different regions. And I know that you didn't just come up with your theory from the United States. Was curious, first of all, where this idea came from and also whether you think these ideas are universal or mostly Western, you know, America, North America. So. Talk a little bit first about where you came up with the idea, um, you know, and then I'd love to talk about geographies, whether these are things that are, are, are applicable around the world right now. So, so this is, uh, this picture really brings back a, a lot of memories. It's from the Orange Revolution in, in Kiev, Ukraine, which took place in 2004 and 2005. And I was living in Kiev then, and I, I was not only living there, I was, I was leading a major news organization. So this is something I was very much involved with. And a couple of things really made an impression on me. First of all, there was this incredible feeling of confusion where nobody seemed to, to know, to really have a grip on exactly what was going on or what would happen next. Certainly, uh, not the the journalists that I would speak to every day in the newsroom, not not the other uh, business leaders, nor the political leaders that I would run into from time to time, really understood. Nobody who had any conventional form of power seemed to have any real ability to to shape events. And at the same time, there was just this mysterious force that nobody nobody could describe, but nobody could deny that seemed to be moving events along. And you would see uh, thousands upon thousands of people who would ordinarily be doing very, very different things, all of a sudden stop what they were doing and start doing the same thing in almost perfect unison. And I thought to myself, gee, I'd really like to know how to do that. And, uh, and I, I wish I could get, you know, I, I had, thousands upon thousands of potential customers, all, uh, you know, buying different things. Wouldn't it be great if I could buy, get them to all unify on the one thing I was trying to sell them? And I had hundreds of employees, all bright people, ambitious with their own ideas. I wanted them to embrace the few initiatives that I thought needed to be priorities. Similar things with investors and advertisers, but I had no idea how to do that. And 
uh, and then it was just a couple of years later, I was in Silicon Valley. Everybody's talking about social networks. I thought it was something I should learn about. I started studying network science and found almost a perfect mathematical representation for everything that happened during the Orange Revolution. And that's how I got hooked on studying movements. And then, and this goes very much to your point about societies. Then I met uh, my friend, Sir Ja, who overthrows countries for a living. <laughs> he started in Serbia. Wait, is that on his business card? Like, like I overthrow countries? N not exactly. Uh, I don't even, I, I've never actually seen his business card, actually. He spends a lot of time in out-of-the-way locations, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But he, he has created this, this repeatable model for overthrowing, uh, uh, for transforming societies. He, he, he helped lead the movement that overthrew Milosevic in, in Serbia. Then he trained got the guys in Georgia with the Rose Revolution, then Ukraine, the, the Orange Revolution. And then he created this organization called the Center for Applied Nonviolent Action and Strategies. And since then, they've been active in almost 50 countries throughout the world, on all, every continent you can think of, from Egypt to Zimbabwe to Burma and on and on and on. And he, and he found this, he has uh, developed this repeatable model that he actually found from another guy named Gene Sharp. So a lot of this stuff has been around for decades. And I wanted to find out the question I was interested in was can this be applied into an organizational or industrial setting? And that was really a, the exciting thing about researching Cascades is going out and uh, finding people who'd, who'd run or been involved with major corporate or organizational or societal transformations and seeing if those same principles apply. And in fact, I, what I found is they, they applied to an incredible extent. So much so that I would, uh, I would sometimes ask people questions and they would say, really, is that like a thing? Because that happened to us, but I didn't know that was, is that usual? And you'd hear the same echoes of the same experiences in vastly different contexts. Well, I'm gonna break it down a little bit to get practical around business because the, first of all, there's so much to talk about in, in terms of the book and the, the idea that, the, first of all, that traditional business training doesn't really embrace this new mindset that's really important. And, and that I think that initial statistic of the fact that we're trying to change in a way that isn't the same as 1985 or whatever, you know, we're not in cassette tape land, and yet that's a lot of the formal training is still based on that mindset. And I also think that this idea that something that works politically in terms of getting people to galvanize around a movement is made up of something very special that is very different and applicable in, in your in your telling of the story very applicable to business leadership and and i'm very interested in that as is our audience um and so i'd love to find out first of all there's this notion about differentiating values and shifting from that to shared values so start with that and then we'll walk through the idea of some companies that have done well with an example. Sure, so this, this, is, an, uh, this is actually an incredible thing to see when, it, when we do it in workshops because pick a, an idea, any idea that people are really, really excited about. And I think agile, agile uh, development is, is, is a great example of this where there is, it has such strong differentiating values. It has an agile manifesto. It, it breaks away from old thinking. There's no more technical requirements. Everything's focused on user stories. And that makes people incredibly passionate about agile. So much so that usually when people come back from their first agile workshop, they're acting absolutely unbearable to, to, <laughs> to be with them for a few weeks because they keep talking almost like fanatical about these values that they're so excited about. Those are the types of things that make people passionate about something. Those are not the things that, make, that help 
bring new people in. So it, you have to get people to switch from those differentiating values to the shared values. Things, so for agile, things like uh, high quality projects that are done on time uh, and under budget. So, uh, because those are things that everybody shares. And then that's how you, that's uh, the sort of common currency. And that's how you meet people where they are, not where you want them to be. And that's the first step towards bringing them in. And well, it's, I, it, yeah, it's, it's well, it really is an incredible, incredibly important step. Well, I'm going to interrupt for just a second because there is kind of a paradox, right? So the individual gets infected with enthusiasm over a certain set of values or a certain set of beliefs. However, it's almost antithetical to what it will take to engage others in that same level of individual excitement. So Andrea goes to an agile workshop, I come back, I just can't stop talking about it. But yet my peers who have no exposure to that new concept kind of scratch their heads like, well, we got to get back to business, like good for you, Andrea, but not necessarily going to get on my bandwagon. So I know you have examples from social movements and also we'll talk a little bit about PNG in a second of places where the fire, and I love the graphic on your book because it's like striking a match, right? You, if you do this well, if you lead well, you create a movement and I, and I live in California, so we don't like to talk about wildfires, but unfortunately it's, a, it's, a, <laughs> it's an act of nature that, you know, if you start the right fire burning, it does, have a life of its own, it spreads in a natural way. And when it's for good, it can actually have a very different impact than an individual trying to get another individual or what you said earlier, which made no sense to me when I first thought about it. You know, why would it be different for Andrea to be inspired by factor X? And yet if a leader wants to start a movement to get everyone to feel that way, you can't, you can't just do on an individual basis, what Andrea experienced, because the, the mainstream well, hasn't gotten there. Let me, let me cut you off there. That's not how you start a movement. That's how you grow a movement. You start a movement, not by convincing people, but by identifying people who are already enthusiastic about the change. So it's actually more paradoxical than, than you even made it out to be, because at the one hand, you need to harness that enthusiasm. On the other hand, you need to make them open to the concerns of others outside the movement, right? You can't, you can't run a movement, right? By just preaching to the choir. I think that's great. <laughs> that's not that, how that you works. evangelize something. You evangelize <laughs> it by getting out and mixing with the heretics. Yeah, okay, so, so tell us a little bit about, this is not just a theory, this is an observation that you made, have, have made for many years now, uh, no, actually, this work. is this is not this is this one. This example is actually not in the book. Right. It's a, it's in, yeah. in the book is like Netflix and Experian, which you Netflix you is there. So Experian is there. Alcoa is there. Alcoa, right. Uh, we have plenty of it, but Procter and Gamble wasn't in there. And actually, uh, this is kind of a funny thing because the guys who are doing this. Uh, uh, came across Cascades and were inspired by it, or I was writing about Cascades. I, I forget, but basically what it was, was three guys, because it, it, if you go back to, to traditional change management, I call it the, the persuasion model of change, right? Yeah. Where you, uh, you know, you create a sense of, of, uh, uh, what's a, a, se a sense of urgency around the change and get, commitment, which made perfect sense back in 1983 when you were trying to get people to feel okay about something that already happened. Uh, but anybody who, when you're talking about changing actions, anybody who's ever been married or has a kid knows how difficult it can be to persuade even one person. If you think you're going to persuade hundreds or thousands, that's a really tough job. These guys, they didn't go and, and try and persuade anybody. They went and they said, let's make one change, right? Uh, there's this process in our plan. And we know it, 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 it's, it's, it's really slow. It, take, it took like three weeks. It was a huge bottleneck throughout the organization. And they said, 
we think we can do that better. We think using digital tools, we could get it down to, uh, to just a few hours. And it, they worked for like six or eight months or something like that. And they did it. And it was a huge thing and they won an award for it. And then they read Cascades. I'm not exactly sure what the sequence is, but they went and they said, hey, we could do that. To, we could use that, those uh, principles to grow this one little project we did into a big movement, which they have. It's now called PXG. It's, I think, it, at six or eight different uh, facilities within Procter & Gamble's research organization. It involves, I think, a few thousand people. And it's all about going and using digital tools to improve processes at least tenfold. And it's, it's creating an enormous wave or movement of, of uh, efficiency throughout Procter & Gamble's research organization. And what I think is so great about it was these guys are true revolutionaries, right? But they didn't disrupt their organization. They made it better. They didn't ask for permission. They went and solved a problem and then they scaled it. And uh, I, I just, I thought it was like the coolest thing, especially that they said reading Cascades helped them do it. So that really felt good. I think it's great. And, and I think there's a lot of takeaways here. I mean, there's one more, there's one more concept that I think is important, you know, beyond this, which is this idea of skills-based transformation. And that first, the, the Procter & Gamble story is interesting because the idea of doing something at a small scale and figuring out ways to socialize that and, and bring it to a larger scale within an organization requires a talent for building these movements. And it can't just be walking around with a PowerPoint uh, and getting people to be on, get on board that this process of building a cascade involves people's beliefs and, and really how they were able to get other people to buy in. But I'd like to also talk about another precept before we uh, move to the final part, which is, you know, why is skills-based transformation so important? And I know you have a model and would love to have some, some background on what, what is skills-based transformation? Well, skills-based transformation is, again, something I, I, I came across after the book was written when, when so many people came to me with, with their own stories. Uh, I think a great example is Experian, which was in the book, uh, where the CIO, a guy named Barry Libinson, he, he, he comes to the company, he spends a few months, and he, uh, and he, he spends, spends a few months talking to, to customers, and he finds that they're all asking for the same thing, real-time access to data. And he is a very capable CIO. He knew exactly how to solve that problem. You shift from on-premise uh, IT architecture to a, to a cloud-based architecture. Okay, problem solved. Except he knew that was going to be incredibly hard to do because he was going to get an enormous amount of pushback. A lot of people were gonna, weren't, weren't going to like that idea. And this is, by the way, what makes transformation so hard is it, we tend to think that transformation is, is making people understand how brilliant our idea is. Sure. Well, that's not the problem. Usually they understand it. They just don't want it. I mean, people talk about corporate antibodies and the corporate immune system. There's no such thing. That's a fiction. There's just a bunch of people who don't like your idea, right? Mm -hmm. and, and Barry knew that people weren't going to like his idea for some really good reasons. One, uh, around cybersecurity. And a few years after he started, we, there was that horrible breach at their competitor, Equifax. Another, uh, losing control of, of the business model. So those were really, really important objections that he would have to overcome and, uh, and staunch opposition that he would have to, to overcome. But, and the cloud transformation itself was very much a strategic and technological transformation. But Barry, being a, a really smart guy, he also understood that that transformation, that, that strategic and technological transformation itself wouldn't succeed without a skills-based transformation because you couldn't make it work unless you shifted from waterfall to agile. In very much the same way, 
uh, a lot of companies are finding that uh, you can't make AI work. You can't make artificial intelligence or machine learning work without uh, user centric design. These are skills that have been around for 10, 20 years, but you still need to get them adopted on a, on a, a, a massive scale within your organization that creates a movement. And the, uh, this graphic here shows the, uh, the, the process that, we, that I, I lay out in the book and that we teach in our workshops. And one thing, just to go back a, a little bit uh, and to push back on something you said about it takes talent to, to have a movement. I guess it takes talent in terms of it, it takes talent to do anything. I never found that any of the movement leaders had any particular traits. In fact, even with people like Gandhi, who when he first got his law degree, he was so shy, he couldn't speak up in court. And, and Mandela, who was this, you know, really extreme nationalist as a young man. I, I never found that, that any of these people who lead, or more, my friend Serja, who overthrows countries, who started off just wanting to play bass in a rock band. <laughs> all the, I, what amazed me about all of these really successful transformation leaders, whether they were someone who was famous like, like uh, Gandhi or Martin Luther King, or maybe not so famous like uh, some of the other people I talk about in my book, Barry Libinson is one that I mentioned, and there's, there's some others is that uh, the one talent that, that really seems to be important is to, uh, to learn from your mistakes, that they all learned along the way. And I think one of the most important things about a movement, the idea of a movement, is that, is, as the name implies, it's kinetic. It changes along the way. It's never you start off with this brilliant idea and everybody just follows behind you. Uh, you you actually do have to be the, become the change you want to see, and that means changing yourself. Um, I have one last question about all of this, and then we're going to do our uh, author's dozen, which is 12 quick questions. If you were going to tell a leader today, you know, um, okay, Andrea, you're in charge of this team, and you've been trained that, you know, this is the end goal, and you've been trained to think of it this way, but here's this Cascades way. Do it, try it this way. Try do these diff, two or three different things. What would I do Monday morning differently? You know, what, what's the most important, you know, maybe two things that I would do for sure to start thinking about a movement and to start thinking about building support and scaling corporate change? Well, first I would tell you, if it's a, if it's a big idea, and it's going to work it's a, if it's a big idea that works. Because again, this isn't about strategy and, and or innovation, right? This is, I, I'm a big fan of strategy and innovation. I've wrote a whole book about that stuff. This is not that. This is about getting adopted, getting an idea scaled. So the first thing I would tell you is to understand that the reason why transformation uh, fails is because somebody hates it and is working to undermine it. So the first thing I would say is imagine a completely evil person and think about it, how an evil person would work to undermine you in a completely dishonest way. And what would they do? Because chances, there's a good chance that's going to happen. And then I would say, Think about where you're, where you're vulnerable, where they're going to attack, how they're going to attack you, and where they're going to attack you. And then thirdly, I would say, think about how an appeal to shared values, right? It's not about the Agile Manifesto. It's about better projects, right? Think about how that appeal to shared values would mitigate those attacks. But anticipate always anticipating because if you think that nobody's going to oppose your idea you're not thinking hard enough i think it's practical i think it's different i think it's refreshing what i like about cascades is that there's a combination of business wisdom and also 
a lot of counter intuitive concepts that make a ton of sense after the fact. May I tell I, just one last story? Absolutely. Because it's, sure. it's, it's, it's one of my favorite and I think one of the most instructive stories in the book. My friend, Sir Ja, he started off in, in his, as a revolutionary in 1992 with a bunch of anti-war protests. He calls it their Occupy phase. So a bunch of students protested the war in, in, uh, in Bosnia and at, at all the major universities in Belgrade. They played a lot of music, they drank some beer, and then classes were over, summer came, and all the protests broke up, and that was the end of that. Uh, then that was in 1992. In 1996, they had a bit more a, a bit more success. They were part of a big movement that won local elections. And then uh, Milosevic said he wasn't going to recognize them. There were massive protests. And eventually he did recognize them. But then the unity fell apart and everything went back to the way it was. So again, 1996, another failure. 1998, they could tell that... Uh, Milosevic wanted to go to war again. They said, look, we have to do something. Five guys got together. And then six, the next day, uh, another six joined them. But five guys got together, well, four guys and one girl, got together in a coffee shop and said, we have to do something. And they thought, what can we do? And they said, well, if we can mobilize people to get to the polls, we can win the election." And they know that they could do that because they had seen it in 1996. He said, and if we can win the election, Milosevic is going to steal it. And when he steals it, that's our chance. They were planning not to win the election, but they were anticipating that he was going to steal it. And 1999, a year later, Otpor, which was the organization, maybe had... Uh, 300 people. Any, any reasonable person would look at, at, at Serbia and say, you know, uh, Slobodan Milosevic, he's going to rule the rest of his life. A year after that, Milosevic lost the election. There was a massive movement, took him from power. A year after that or so, he was in The Hague. A few years after that, he dies in his prison cell. That's how change happens. Slowly at first, and then very, very quickly. <laughs> it's one of our favorite concepts. So this brings us to the author's dozen, and it goes really fast, and you can just say anything okay. is fair game. So right now, what's overhyped? Digital technology. And what's underhyped? What's underhyped is uh, materials and manufacturing, the uh, physical world technology. What's your favorite quote, real or imagined? G.H. Hardy, uh, for any, for any serious, for any serious purpose, intelligence is a rather minor gift. <laughs> well, what's your favorite statistic, real or imagined? Uh, Carson Wentz threw for over four thousand yards with uh, no receivers getting over five hundred yards last year. That's true. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Um, okay. As a so Philly gonna, girl, you should be keeping I up with me. this as a Philly girl. Um, not a sports girl, necessarily. I'm trying. Uh, so other than Sean Moffat and Andrea Cates, the future proofers, what, uh, who would you invite over to a change maker's last supper? Like, what's the one person you would invite, for sure, to a change maker's last supper? I <laughs> would say, I would say uh, Richard Feynman, just for the laughs. <laughs> Yeah, we know that some of these Last Suppers don't turn out so well, but that's a whole other story. Um, if you were 23 again, not that you're not 23, but if you were 23 again, um, given what you know now, what, what would you be doing? You know what, I, I, would, I would join the Peace Corps because I spent a, a significant, as you know, a significant time, 15 years overseas. And anybody who joined the Peace Corps seemed uh, to really, it, really have a great experience and, and it really seemed to benefit them professionally later on. So, and they, they learn language skills and, uh, and cultural skills. And, uh, and I think it's, it's one of those, mo one of the most underrated programs. I wish I had known somebody who'd done the Peace Corps when, when I was as that age, because 
when I was older I, and having met so many people who did it and, and benefited from it, I, I really wish I'd done something like that. Okay, so here's a two, uh, a double header. Uh, a company you admire today that we've heard of and a company you admire today that we've maybe never heard of. I think there's a lot of companies I admire today. Usually I admire people, companies like Procter and Gamble and, and IBM, companies that are still competitive after a hundred years. I think those are ones that we can really, really learn from. I'm really impressed with, with Google and how they have built, uh, how they inve have invested in the technologies, in, in the next thing after, after, after search, even though they don't know what that thing is, but how much they're doing with self-driving cars and quantum computing and all sorts of stuff. To, to so that the company will survive when they can, when search isn't such a great business anymore. Company you, you've never heard of that I think is just amazing. It's a, a company called Citrine Informatics. They're in the materials discovery space. And they sort of remind me of a little bit of Google, but more of like Genentech, like a company that is com almost single-handedly inventing its own category. Uh, How do you spell it? Citrine, S-I-T-R-I-N-E. The, the CEO is a guy named Greg Maholand. Who's, right. Uh, he, he could be on the future, on a future uh, podcast. And um, how would you like other people to describe you? This is not an epitaph question, but how would you like other people to describe you as a change maker or impact maker? Like what, what would be like three words? Uh, empowers others. I, 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 yeah. I would like to be thought of as somebody who, who's helpful and empowers others. Uh, what's a technology or emerging innovation that is intriguing for you? Certainly quantum computing, but, uh, it, well, the new uh, computer architectures in general, but also I think what's going on in material science is, is, is amazing, as well as synthetic biology. But I think those three things are, are really what's going to drive the next 30, 40, 50 years. And last one uh, before we do the closeout is what do you do for fun? My 10 year old daughter is the most fun. And I, uh, when I'm doing something fun, I'm usually doing it with her and my wife. And this coronavirus crisis, as, uh, as tough as it's been, uh, getting the time to go on walks and spend more time with them is, has been an, an absolute, uh, prize. Well, this has been fascinating. We always run out of time before we run out of topics. And I wanted to thank Greg Sattel. You've been really interesting and it's a good conversation. A lot to think about in terms of the way that leaders, especially in business, which is our audience, can rethink assumptions and start to build movements in this new way of thinking. And we hope everybody buys the book. It didn't come out this, when did it come out? It came out, uh, August 12th, 2019, uh, 2019, so. 2019, and it's uh, at least as relevant Excuse as- Excuse me, uh, April 12th. If, if Actually, not so, uh, a year ago this week. Oh, I didn't well, realize congratulations. that. Happy yeah. birthday to them. Yeah. And once again, we are future-proofing next, and we are a practical path to a bolder future. We'd like to thank Greg Sattel for helping to lead us to some new ways of thinking about leadership and business in the practical path to a bolder future. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me, Andrea.